morning, and I want to thank the virtual platform for inviting me. It looks like a great and very exciting event. And I want to be very brief here. I guess the reason I'm invited is because I have been involved with Artport, which is the Whitney Museum's portal to internet art. I do not want to go through it. It's a website I founded in 2001. We commissioned um, a series of projects for it, and there also is an archive of gate pages here. Those were little projects that artists created on a monthly basis. So this is an archive of net art that naturally will pose some issues regarding preservation in the future. So far, most of it is still fine. One thing I made sure was that with commissioning every project, we gathered um, extensive information about requirements, which um, version of Flash, uh, CGI scripts, PHP is needed for each project so that if problems arise in the future, we at least have a record for it. One important point is that none of the works on Artboard that you see here among the commissioned projects made it into the Whitney's collection officially. And there were two reasons for it. A, I thought that the Whitney wasn't able to pay enough money at um, that point in time to do that. I would have liked to, um, for them to really put more money towards purchasing them. Two was that there were no real preservation strategies in place and I firmly believe in distribute or die. So these are non-exclusive licenses. All the artists are also retaining copies of the work because I feel that will make it easier um, in the future to work on preservation. So the Whitney officially has only one work of uh, net art in its collection, which is uh, Douglas Davis' first collaborative sentence. And that has turned into a bit of a nightmare for uh, me. The project was done in 1994. And it's simple HTML, so it should be fairly um, easy to preserve. You're probably all familiar with the project. I'm just clicking through some pages. It's one ongoing sentence to which you um, can add, keep adding. The only rule here is no period, so it goes on and on. So I can click through all these um, pages of HTML. And one issue is it's really unformatted. It was done in 1994, so it's true dirt style here. I mean, the font varies from page to page. The link uh, structure varies. So there's one very simple question. Well, should we do something about that, or should we keep the original dirt style aesthetics of the piece? Um, it's a severe case of link rot by now, because people were able to link outside, and um, most of these links are dead. Do we leave it like that as a comment on the internet or do we go to the internet archive and do research and actually try to recreate the pages with the links, which is a lot of work that would be um, possible to do. So that's another um, question. A third one is you, if you click through this, you will find pages that are completely garbled. And the reason for that being that the project was included at some point in time in various exhibitions in Asia. So um, different character sets were um, used and you have a lot of garbled pages. Again, do we leave that as a comment on language barriers on the internet? Is that just what it is? Or do we go to the trouble of actually um, restoring with the appropriate um, character sets these pages and actually translate um, them? So these are the um, major issues um, that are posed by Artport, but I don't um, want to talk about um, Artport alone here because I want to devote a little bit of time um, to talk about what else is involved for um, the museum. I do not think that it would be effective for the Whitney to um, devote time only to um, thinking about internet, work, but the strategy has to be much broader. There are other works in the Whitney collection, such as Cory Archangel Super Mario Cloud, we engineered um, Nintendo system, or John F. Simon Jr.'s uh, color panel version 1.0, which is um, software on an altered Apple PowerBook. 
There are, of course, numerous uh, preservation initiatives underway. This list is by no means exclusive. I know there are many more, and in the Netherlands, people are <laughs> working on different projects. I have been involved with, um, through the Whitney, mostly with the Variable Media Network, a uh, consortium project that was founded by the Guggenheim Museum. Johnny Polito was the one who um, actually initiated this together with the Danielle Longlois Foundation and has had a lot of member organizations over the years, some of which stayed with it. The Berkeley Art Museum and Pacific Film Archive was substantial, Cleveland Performance Art Festival and Archive, the Walker, Franklin Furness, Rhizome, um, and the Whitney. Um, there are other initiatives such as Media Matters, a consortium that includes uh, MoMA, SF MoMA, and the Tate. Um, V2 has done unstable media here in the Netherlands. And um, the Variable Media Network has brought about a few working groups archiving the avant-garde and forging the future, which I'm involved in right now, which is funded by a grant from the National Endowment for the Humanities. <coughs> there are four major um, preservation strategies, which I'm sure you're all familiar with. I don't want to go into them. Um, too deeply that have been used so far. Um, one would be the most inelegant one, storage, collecting software and hardware as it continues to be developed. Obviously that web very quickly leads to a huge archive, but sometimes cannot be avoided if the project is a true hardware um, project. Then emulation, recreating the software, hardware and um, operating systems through emulators, which is appropriate for um, some projects. SF MoMA is actually going to establish a virtual server for its um, works in the net art collection and virtual servers are these servers that actually emulate various programs through time. So, you know, if the project has been created for a glitch in Netscape one point, whatever, then Netscape can be um, replicated on that server um, in that particular version. Then there's migration, the upgrading of the work to the next version of hardware and software, or reinterpretation, the restaging of the work in a contemporary context and environment. And one thing I want to make very clear here, the challenge when it comes to preservation is to talk about main and basic approaches, and um, we all need to find the lowest common denominator to talk um, about projects to each other, but I firmly believe that when it comes to the preservation of a single work, decisions have to be made on a case-by-case -case, um, basis with the help of the artist, so there's no way that we will find an approach to preservation. There are only approaches to preserving projects, and that is nothing new because that has been the history of art and what every conservator deals with forever. Um, so nothing will change on that front. And I want to um, talk a little bit about the Forging the Future initiative and the tools we have developed so far. Okay. And the tool I have been most um, involved with is actually the variable uh, media questionnaire. So some of the needs that the Forging the Future initiative tries to answer to are documenting the past, the present, and the future. And there are various tools that answer, or provide certain answers to these aspects. Um, the Franklin Furness database is actually a database for um, performing art and um, archiving that mostly the art created by, um, or collected by Franklin Furness, but of course this is supposed to be a model for what can be done for other organizations. Um, when it comes to the uh, presence, we have the Digital Assets Management Database, which has been involved mostly by the Berkeley Art Museum and Pacific um, Film Archive, although they're not even going to use it, they move beyond that with the Open Museum um, Initiative. And when it comes to the future, um, we have the Variable Media Questionnaire, which is actually a questionnaire for doing interviews with artists, which I, I have been using in various um, case studies for um, the Whitney. And then um, we try to connect all of this data in a meta um, server. 
there's also the vocabulary um, wiki. All of this will be documented or is already documented at forgingthefuture.net. All of these tools are meant to be open source, usable um, by everyone and accessible um, to everyone. And we're still in the process of developing everything. So what I've been doing for the um, Whitney was um, very much actually test driving the variable media questionnaire. And the questionnaire um, is web-based, so um, right now it's not ac accessible online, but I can give anyone um, interested access um, to it and a password so you can poke around. Um, in the questionnaire, every work has stakeholders, um, artists, and certain components that you can identify and attach to a work. And um, every component or part has certain questions attached to it. And all the questions have potential answers that an artist um, can choose. And the inter then you do interviews with the artists, and the interviews have stakeholders attached to them. The interviewer, which is very often the museum or commissioning organization, and the artist as interviewee, and then actual responses. And I believe that it's actually crucial to have a record of what artists intended a work um, to be, and this is what preservation um, should be based upon in the end. I'm switching back to some um, screenshots of the questionnaire because for some reason the server is down and I can't access it live right now. This was an interview I uh, conducted with Jennifer Crow and Scott Patterson for a project commissioned by the Whitney and this is a mobile media project. I don't want to go into the project itself, I basically just want to um, show the components of the questionnaire. So here are um, the components or parts I chose for that specific project and as you can see there are major groupings such as the source, the material, the environment, and the interaction. And all of these need to be preserved. All of these can break down to some extent. The source can be generic software, such as um, the use of Flash for the creation of a project. Or it can be custom um, software that an artist wrote. Uh, the source is also the key concept of the work. Then you have materials such as the media display, the screens, which change ratio, change resolution on a continuous ongoing basis. Um, hardware, of course, changes. Uh, operating systems um, change. Material could also be locative um, sensors. Then you have the whole environment. Is it um, the gallery or is it some other external uh, physical reference? And how is the user participant um, being involved? Is it a single user project, a multi-user project? Um, what is the viewer's role in it? All of these are questions that can be attached to a work and um, need to be answered. So each and every one of these components has a set of um, pre-configured um, questions, but you can also add questions yourself. Artists can um, change them. So you see some of them related to the media display, um, how should you accommodate changes in resolution, in color depth, in image um, size change, etc. So we have done um, some of these interviews. Um, we also were very lucky because the color panel <coughs> 1.0 was included in one of these um, studies and in an exhibition that the Guggenheim um, did, uh, which was called Seeing Double. So it the work was migrated to different platforms, so we have a very good preservation um, record of that. We have done interviews with Corey Arik Angel, who changed, I'm stopping right now, <laughs> uh, who changed his mind already on strategies because he was always in previous interviews firmly against emulation of that project. Now in Nintendo is ultimately emulating itself already, moving to new platforms, and at that point Corey concluded, well, why would I be against emulation if Nintendo is already emulating, so it's fine with me. And coming back to the net art component, again, all of this initiative is meant to be media independent, so it should be applicable to both net art and installation and other projects. And um, the net art project I have been um, working on 
was the longest sentence and I now ran into a big problem and I'm very frustrated with myself mostly because all I would have needed to do was just the change the order of doing interviews. When I tried to set up an interview with Douglas Davis last year, I realized that it was very hard to talk to him, that he was uh, basically losing his mind. He's now in a home. His family does not think that I will ever be able to do an interview. So all of these questions I put to you will now have to be answered by me and the conservator and will never be answered by him in all likelihood. So what we're probably going to do is create different versions of the sentence, which is one advantage you have with net art. And then you have different propositions as to how it could be preserved, but we will never be able to tell you how the artist himself wanted it to be preserved. So I'll end it right here. <laughs> Thank you very much, Christian, for that brief uh, introduction. Sorry, we don't have more time. Are there any burning questions from the audience? We don't have a lot of time. Well, I mean, it's fantastic to see how these ideas of variable media uh, and thinking about you know, preserving uh, variable art and also connecting visual art with contemporary art, which has the same problems, how these ideas evolved over 10 years. And, You've been working a lot with the Viral Media Network, of course, and I think they were most famous because they introduced the concept of behaviors mm -hmm. uh, to them. How does that reflect again now in this uh, fortunate future? Mm -hmm. It's still the same um, concept, so we still have the same media independent um, behaviors. If I had access to the questionnaire right now, I could show you how it translates back. Once you're done with the questions, you still have all these behaviors attached to basically the approaches. So the behaviors survive, but in the first versions of the variable media questionnaire, the behaviors were the main interface. Now it's switched to components, but the components still have all the behaviors attached um, to them. And just to give a few examples of the behaviors, these are whether a work is um, participatory, with, um, whether it is um, stored, or um, eight behaviors, basically. So they're still there. <laughs> I think we have time for maybe one more question. It is very, uh, <coughs> so I understood your system, um, which is in the tradition of any documentation, but there's a lot thing which is not mentioned here, and <clears throat> that is, of course, how you choose what to document. And then I will put that question into perspective and will say the past will be never past again in the future. In other words, we, uh, there are many things, the past is just passing away. And in our desperate attempts, because we don't like to die, and uh, we will where we try to replicate the past and we will never be able to do so. And so, is it the initiative of the, in that perspective? Because most of the art is traceless art, in my opinion. And it's good, it's a nice thing, because we need to leave a lot of space for new creations, because we have maybe too much documentation. And it's been my profession for 30 years to document, so I've, I have this strong feeling. So how would you think about completeness and incompleteness, and who makes the choice, what is going to be preserved? So I think that question has, I want to again make that very clear. I would like to keep that question, or always keep that question for myself, very different from attached to um, digital content. It's a completely media independent question that you can ask basically since the existence of art what is documented, who makes the decisions as to what is preserved, to what is shown. This is what museums do, independent curators do. It is not at all <coughs> attached, in my opinion, to the digital itself. It's a much, much broader so. question. I didn't say so. No, no, no. Nevertheless, I just, nevertheless. I totally, under, I totally understand only that there are no misunderstandings about that, that it gets attached to the digital, which I wouldn't want to. And um, I mean, I think every curator and every museum and every organization continuously um, 
thinks about these issues, I can change the museum system of validation, I can try to um, broaden it. I make this, these decisions on a daily um, basis and I think I have more of a vested interest in, for example, pursuing all of this than the museum. If I would not be there, nobody would be doing this. And I, I'm pretty sure that these works would be lost and I think they might be lost if I leave the museum. And here you go, that's one answer um, to your question. There's an institution that makes decisions, here am I trying to make decisions. And I'm not saying that they're infallible or good. Every decision I make means that a lot of other works get left out. And it has been like that throughout the history of art. And I think that we all have to try to create a history of art that is inclusive as it can be. Even if it's only through writing, through, and many of you are art historic, historians who have written um, great essays and articles about works that we probably only will learn about or that will be preserved through writing, through learning um, about them. I think the questions you're asking are the most crucial questions at the bottom of preservation of art history of collection and it's most important to not forget that and to go back to these roots and as actually ask about um, that and within the digital um, in particular. So on that level, they are connected to it, but I think the answer applies to the history of art. Okay, thank you very much, Christian. I think we're gonna have to stop there and go to your working groups. Everyone, it's time to work. <laughs>